Thanks. Um, James McCaffrey, I'm the director of the Massachusetts Sierra Club, and we also want to thank you for um, coming here today and giving this great presentation and for moving the process forward. Um, as you've heard many times today, um, there's a lot of organizations here today that support offshore wind as probably the most important resource that we have to help wean our nation off of fossil fuels and in particular help move our region and our nation beyond coal. Um, we don't have to emphasize to you, but we will put in detailed comments in writing the health impacts and the environmental impacts of having our nation's continued addiction to coal and other fossil fuels, national security risks, climate change risks, and the public health impacts that are, that are paramount with having too much dependence on those fuels. I think um, given that um, offshore wind is such a tremendous resource in our nation and has such tremendous potential, it's really important to get it right. Um, and it's clear that you're trying to move forward with that um, and get it right from the start, as the program says. Um, but I want to echo um, some of the comments that were said earlier um, by Charles Mayo about some of the marine habitat and implications and the gaps in the data that we have, for example, for a species like the northern right whale. Um, we need to really know what those gaps are, identify the data, collect that, but most importantly, perhaps, the process and the projects themselves have to be adaptive to new information as we acquire it um, and make sure that we can adjust based on new information, and that's so important because, as noted, there is so little information out there about some of these species, and some of them move around so much that the information that we have now might be very different than what we would have five years from now based on the migratory patterns of some of the species. And I also wanted to note um, that the, the process itself is critical, and this is key, and we recognize that it's not part of your um, jurisdiction, but just as important as moving the process forward is actually securing contracts for these projects. So we would encourage everyone in this room to do everything they can within their power, including the administration, which has some oversight over these processes, to try and make sure that we secure contracts at, at the moment um, the only signed contract that we have is National Grid, um, the only utility that's committed to purchasing offshore wind, and we need the other utilities to actually step up, and we need to provide the incentives to make that possible for them to step up and make this actually a viable resource for the developer, uh, economical resource for the developers to move forward. And the last point um, I wanted to make was just echo what the comments started with earlier here today that, uh, that Emily said. Um, it's really key in your alternatives analysis to look at the cost of not doing this. And that touches on so many of the points that you've heard today. But um, that can't be emphasized enough, because sometimes in the no-build analysis, you just that's usually a paragraph in an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. And this needs to be much more comprehensive and look at the impacts of not moving forward with developing this resource. Thanks for coming here today. about um, expediting the process uh, to ensure that we get the benefits of offshore wind as quickly as possible. Um, and um, as a representative, as a former employee of nonprofit environmental organizations, including Union of Concerned Scientists and MassPERD, and 
state agencies, I think like many of the environmentalists in the room, um, we're cons we are legitimately concerned about the, the, uh, the actual environmental impacts and the uh, 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 honoring the important environmental statutes and regulations that we have in the United States. Um, they, I believe also uh, that we have, will be able to, as others have said, we will be able to uh, identify um, the significant impacts, the, in, the impacts, the, uh, the loan process is so comprehensive with the feedback from the fishermen and, and the habitat group right now. We're identifying where all the real problems are and about learning how to avoid them. Uh, ultimately, the, uh, it's important that we continue to go through and, and we have to legally go through the uh, National Environmental Policy Act review process uh, and honor those uh, environmental regulations. I want to specifically commend uh, the uh, Bureau staff, uh, led by uh, Maureen Bornholt, who has been working for the, ever since the initial regulations were established uh, to uh, uh, work with uh, members of the environmental community and the development community to uh, to streamline the environmental review process. Uh, originally we started with three full environmental impact statements and by working through the process um, they have recognized that uh, if we do thorough and careful analysis up front, usually an environmental assessment is sufficient to, to move through the early stages to get to a final full environmental impact uh, statement for, before construction. And that that is consistent with the National Environmental Policy Act and the Bowen staff has done a great job of identifying how we can move this process more efficiently uh, while honoring and respecting all our environmental regulations. So I, I just wanted to state that for those of you who haven't followed the process closely. Everyone's input here is important and we look forward to working with you moving forward and <coughs> eventually uh, obtaining the fruits of this uh, work. <laughs> alone we have a scientific uh, uh, studies program where we receive appropriated dollars from Congress to help us once we have data or, or questions or gaps identified to be able to uh, contract for science and research to be able to help us answer those questions so we can make a full decision. That's the, one of the simple answers. Probably the more nuanced answer is our intergovernmental task force and the federal family and the state family and the tribal um, organizations that participate in we know that there are incredible data that the Fish and Wildlife Service has, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Geological Service, and the Department of Interior, as well as they have expertise and, and subject matter experts who understand where these gaps are. We have those relationships with the state, like with the Commonwealth, and we have the need with the Habitat Group group that help us understand what those gaps and information sets are. So we have that kind of um, infrastructure, if you would, available to us. We have formalized uh, relationships with several of the entities, uh, NOAA in particular, but also with the Department of Energy, because one part of the equation is, of course, the biological, physical, and socioeconomic resources and issues, but the other aspect is the technology. And so we have a very unique relationship with the R&D element of the Department of Energy to work together to be able to, to give them the questions that we have with regard to the technology so they can use their powerful buying power to be able to undertake the research and then get us some so I think the infrastructure is there. Is it perfect? No. Is it incredibly well funded? It's sufficiently funded. But I think that we can use that to help identify gaps and, and help us address some of those answers. So I think we have something that, that's useful, useful there. But I think we cannot underestimate just the common knowledge and, and traditional knowledge. I think that's one of the exciting things that we have the opportunity to benefit from in the Northeast. We have tribal leaders and their understanding of the environment and watching the change that has occurred. So we have the formal research structures and the university systems and our partnerships with federal entities and state entities, but we also
had this unique opportunity to work with the tribal leaderships in those communities to upload their information. So is it perfect and it's sufficient? Probably not, but, it, but it's sufficient, but is it perfect? Probably not. So I think we have the right tools. We just have to maximize it. Oh, I spoke earlier, uh, Edward Wall, uh, pick up on the notion of the grid. I think one of the barriers to getting this job done, getting this field of uh, come to fruition, is finding the places where you bring the energy on shore. And the sooner you can identify those possible sources and people can start to work on getting the permits, the better off you are. That's one of the things that held up Cape Wind for years, just getting that extra three miles of cable from the, from the ocean into, onto the land to connect to the grid. And you're gonna be competing with the fossil fuel plants, access to the grid and who's gonna have priority as well as local, uh, uh, local preferences of where they want to come to shore. But identify those early and start that process early. We can do that. That's kind of the advantage of when we go out with this a request for interest or a call for information nomination that we ask, you know, what are your concepts? So we can gather that information and see, hey, as we're moving down the line towards holding a lease sale or issuing leases not competitively, you know, taking a look at addressing that issue one. And I believe, and I think Bill reminded, this, uh, reminded me of this at last night's meeting, is when we went out with a request for interest, the state also went out with a companion kind of call with regard to a kind of like, like interstate sort of transmission opportunities there. And so I think that this data gathering can manifest itself in some cohesive, effective, maybe smart way of approaching transmission. Uh, we've done it in California when we had oil and gas and taking a look at the state's wish not to have all these pipelines going to shore and have something planned and cohesive. So I think there's opportunities for to be able to do that. With regard to the NEPA compliance, whether it's on transmission or uh, facilities by facilities, that's the other nice thing about moving together with a large area like this, is that we can see when we get to a lease sale or not a lease issuance, how many projects are being brought online. What is the timing? Because it may be that instead of doing individual construction operation plan environmental impact statements, because they are really intensive efforts, if we could do multi-project, if it seems to be that there's some synergy and timing and issues in area, maybe transmission is a little bit tying them together perhaps, then maybe we can do one document like that. So I think that the options are there. As we learn more about what the proposals are, what the environmental issues are, and the timing of that, we can make sure that we continue being wicked smart, as Jack said, and have some of these efficiencies to go along. You're right, to remove the burden from us as feds, from the state and the public, 